and begin with something very, very earlier than colonial morality. Begin with Krishna Devaraya's empire. When the empire disintegrates and about to, he had these warlocks, Karnayakas, all over South India. In fact, the reason why Krishna Devaraya had favorite Telugu is not because he really loved Telugu and his own language, it's because it's politically expedient to talk about Telugu. And all the warlords distributed over different areas for Telugu people. And here in Madurai and Tanjore, those Telugu lord Nayak, they're called Nayakas. I call them warlords. Okay? These Nayakas became important and independent on their own when Krishnavara's empire disintegrated. Okay? That's one thing. But that is historical. There is something more important that happened at that time. Both Tanjore and Madurai, the kings that went there, Nayakas that went there, acquired kingship in, in addition to that. They said the king was God. So there is an assimilation between king and God at that time. That's a difference that you do not have during Krishna Devaraya's empire. The beginnings of it I showed you last lecture, where, for example, Tenali Raman hesitates, ridicules King Krishna Devaraya for accepting the praise that it was Krishna. But that's not during the time of Krishna Devaraya. Something, something later it happened, and it was recorded in the folklore, so in the oral tradition, as Tanad Raman was doing that. The king is assimilated to God. Something very, very interesting happened. When the king is king, a Kshatriya, and Brahmana was there, both of them made each other. Brahmanas made Kshatriyas, Kshatriyas made Brahmanas. Krishna Yavara is not a Brahmana himself, but they gave him the status of being a Brahmana again. So every king was not a high caste king, high caste non-Brahmin king. Not, there is no born in Kshatriya anywhere in India. And these Kshatriyas now have made Kshatriyas, they have elevated the status of Kshatriyas by Brahmanas. So each one made the other right. And king said, I am God myself. What happened to Brahmin? Demoted. So Brahmin is no more important for this empire. Brahmin becomes delegated to a relatively unimportant position. And the most he can do is serve God. There is something other than that happening at the same time. If king is God, who would be the most really interesting people in his court? Who would be closer to king? Women, of course, because he's God. Therefore, women serve God better than anybody. And therefore, women become important. If you really observe that, in Tanjore, and later in Madurai too, the important people, court poets, were women. For the first time in South India, you have, or probably anywhere in India, you have women as court poets. Rangajamma and Bhakti, Ramabhadramba. That's a very important difference I'm making here. King becomes God. As a result, there is another very important thing that's happening which began even during Krishna Devaraya's time, as Keshavan was supported. The resources of the kingdom were largely in cash, not in any other more, particularly in Tanjore. What does that mean? When you get money, income is largely in cash. Something very, very significant happens. Earlier, you are important in society because I was born in that particular caste. I am in this family. My grandfather, my father's father, and all those people, the people. That's how I'm important now. No. I'm important because I have money. I made money, and therefore I'm important. It's a very important sociological change that took place. So if you have Brahmana, Kshatriya, Vaishya, that organization, at least in your mind, that conceptual organization of society has completely been distorted. Because whoever has money 
becomes important. Now, Brahman was no more important. Kshatriya and Vaishya, they become assimilated. Because it's the, the kings, the Nayaka kings that there, they were Balijas, most of them. And Balijas were traitors. They sold and made money. So Balija becomes a king, which means the Vaishya becomes a Kshatriya. So once the Vaishya Kshatriya relationship is erased, you have a real problem in your conceptual thinking of society. So if, what happens then? If a person becomes important because he has money, and secondly, a person becomes important because of this assimilation of Kshatriya and, and Vaishya, major dislocation happens in the conceptual thinking about the order of the society. And the poets have to deal with it. That is why, in this time, the mythological themes that were already available to you from the past, I will reread them. Let me explain to you what that means. Violation themes are real. There are several. Chandra falls in love with his teacher's wife in Buddha's form. We know that before as a part of mythology. But now, the same theme is revisited, Tara Asheshanka, and revisited with a lot of gusto, with a lot of joy. Hey, it's wonderful, they fell in love with it. It's wonderful. They described the love affair between Tara and Chandra elaborately detailed. And in the end, of course, Tara is pregnant, guards come, sure, 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 it's okay, it's over. But let her pregnancy be completed. Let the boy be born, then they can go back. So the end is very comfortably, no, nobody is punished. End is very comfortable. So here, the Tara Sheshanka story, which was earlier told with a lot of censure to Chandra and a lot of censure to Tara. Now Tara is raised praised and Chandra is praised and elaborately detailed description of their love affair including their, how they made sex to each other. These are the poems that were written during this time. One more. They have a, they have, there is a Halya and Indra. A Halya, as you know the story, Indra committed her and Gautama was her husband. Usually, as we know very quickly, and, and, and Ahalya says to Indra, hey, has the cock crowed? Indra takes it as a sign and waits. And when he himself became a cock and crowed, Gautama wakes up and goes to the river to take his bath. At that time, you know, Indra comes, makes love to Ahalya, Gautama unfortunately comes sooner than he is expected <laughs> and therefore they were caught in the act and you know these results. This story is retold in a number of ways in mythology. You can write about six articles on this and we will talk about it later. But how was this story taken in this period? Because it is a violation theme. They were revisiting violation themes. They were rewriting violation themes. So, Ahalya Sankrandanam by Samkhamu Venkat Krishna Panayakudu elaborately describes how Ahalya wanted Indra but could not get and Gautama does not pay attention to her and a whole lot of those things are there. And the Bhikshuni comes home, comes to her to visit. And when she visits, hesitatingly, hesitatingly, Ahalya tells him, tells her, you know what, I wanted Indra, but I should not say that. It's very, very dangerous if I say that. So, Bhikshuni listens, what? What's dangerous about it? You're married and you've only one man in your life? What's wrong with you? <laughs> and you're not really trying to get Ahal Indra? That's nonsense. Does Indra know that you are waiting for him to come? No, he doesn't. I am going to tell him. 
Okay? So Bhikshuni, as a matter of fact, tells him all kinds of things. What is good about being a woman? Enjoying sex. If you do not have that, you are not being a woman. So if you are a woman, it is what you should do. And actually one word comes. You have only one man in your life who doesn't pay attention to you. What's wrong with you? That is the kind of advice that this Bhikshuni gives to her. And in fact, in Tara Shashanka, there is one point I forgot to mention. Tara, when Chandra was hesitating, oh, it's not unfair to sleep with my teacher's wife, he says, what? There is a very, very important statement here. Impotent men who would not be able to satisfy their wives to make sure that other men do not touch their wives, wrote in palm leaves that it's wrong to make love to another man's wife. <laughs> okay? Astoka Manisha. Okay? Tata Akula Rona Prasiri. Parangana Zubira Papamans. Okay? <laughs> Please don't pay attention to stupid things. They are only palm leaves. You don't have to pay any attention to them. They are not Shastra texts. Why are you worried about those unnecessary palm leaves? Come, make love to me. So that's the kind of statements that are given to you in these texts. When these texts really appreciated by a lot of people, and South Indian school of Telugu poetry was considered to be a very highly mature period of Telugu poetry, something happens. Just a little after this period, something else, I'll tell you, I forgot to say that. Because cash is important, who is important in when cash is available? Courtesans. Courtesans have a very high status in society. Being a courtesan is not only un not unrespectable, it's respected. Courtesans are poets, courtesans are singers, courtesans come out in public, courtesans make money, and they handle their own lives. But as a matter of fact, make a diagram and say housewife and a courtesan. They're exact opposites of each other. A housewife should be very quiet and should not think of other men. Courtesan should always be thinking of other men. Wife, she should try not to have another man. And if their husband, she pregnant because of her husband, she should expect a son to be born. Whereas a courtesan wants a girl to be born. Okay? Courtesan, housewife, never touches money. Courtesan, courtesan makes money and lives on it. She lives her own life. She doesn't have anybody, not need anybody to manage her life. It can go on and down. So there's Courtesan and housewife, they are exactly replicas of each other, I mean, opposites of each other. Courtesans are the only people who can come out in public, sing and dance and poet, write poetry. They are scholars, they are good poets, they are dancers, and then many of them are there. We really do not know exactly how courtesan culture flourished at that time. Not enough information is available. I have a feeling that courtesan is not a caste, like, for example, later it has become Vesha caste. I believe anybody who wanted to be a courtesan could become a courtesan. They are recruited into courtesan life, not born into courtesan life. It's a very important difference, actually. And now, these courtesans have a social status, social presence, and they have all kinds of attention they get from other men. Now, during this time, there is a courtesan called Muddupalani. This Muddupalani wrote a very interesting book. And that book got a lot of problems in 20th century. It's called Radhika Santam. That's a teasing Radhika. Krishna, we know, was very closely related to Radha. Radha is a little older than Krishna, and they are lovers. It has been continuing for a long time. But Krishna has another girl. 
his own uncle's daughter, his own maternal uncle's daughter. It's a very preferred marriage in South India, at least in Andhra area. Her name is Ila. Now it's time for Ila to marry to Krishna. It's a proper marriage. Maternal uncle's daughter, cross cousin marriage, perfectly acceptable. And Radha cannot object to it. Therefore, prepares Ila to the house, a good housewife, how to love Krishna well, and teaches her in all the arts of love. And you have a very elaborate description of how Radha has teached Ila to be a good housewife, sexually satisfying, attracting his, her husband. Well, the wedding took place, and Ila was sent to Krishna's room. And they were enjoying themselves. But it's very, very difficult to Radha to accept it. She was outside. She never wanted to Krishna have any other woman. And right in her house, Krishna is enjoying with another woman whom she herself had trained. At the end of it, Radha was so perturbed that she sends her pet parrot to Krishna. Hey, tell him that what he is doing is wrong. She could not neglect me. The pet parrot goes there, but when she sees Ila and Krishna enjoying themselves very, very intensely, she could not interrupt them and therefore did not give the message. <coughs> it goes on and on. In the end, the pet parrot finally tells Krishna that Radha is waiting for you. She is really pining for you. You have to go and take care of her. He surrounded with numbers. Oh, there is Radha. I forgot. Okay. <laughs> then he really goes to Radha, tries to appease her in a number of ways. I cannot summarize it because it's a very elaborate way of trying to appease her. And after an elaborate way of trying to observe face, Radha, when Krishna falls on the feet of Radha, and Radha kicks him with his with her left foot. Then Krishna says, Oh, I'm sorry. I hope my foot did not hurt you. <laughs> Eventually, they make, it, make up, and then there's a very intense love meeting between Radha and Krishna. That's how the story ends. Retelling the story doesn't make any difference. Any, it doesn't say anything about the book. It's a really powerful, erotic book. Now, that's exactly when the 19th century comes, the British there, and there is a person called Vireshalingam, Kandukuri Vireshalingam, social reform. He was the one who decided that being a Vaishya is a brought on the society. We should abolish all the Vaishyas. No Vaishya should live. Now, Vesha is taken to be a, a, a harlot. She is not the same Vesha as used to think before. Musician, public performer, poet, and all these things. Now she is simply a whore. She is described as a whore. Efforts have been made by a number of people, especially the men folk of the Vesha families, who wanted to prohibit the Vesha culture wanted to prohibit public dancing by Vaishyas. It's a very elaborate system. And when the prohibition took place, all the Vaishyas lost their job, lost their importance in society, they were treated as whores, and they were taken to court, and they were found to be doing what they used to do as business. Now it's very interesting actually, for legal scholars to look at, how once the law was implemented by British people, how it has to be twisted to make it acceptable and convenient for people who suffer from that law. Vaishyas now say, hey, no, we are not horse. We are God's servants. Devadashi. Mm -hmm. That was what created to tell the court, we are not horse. So now suddenly there is a whole lot of Devadasis. Because court cannot deny that you could be a Devadasi and it's not illegal, right? 
and therefore they could not be sent to jail. So now there is Devdasis and there is the Abolition Act and they were trying to convert Devadasis into or, or could this force into housewives. Try to give them something to do which is respectable and try to see if they can get married and live a normal wife, a normal life of a wife. Wife who subservient to your husband and all those things. There's a whole story that goes through it. It's not easy. Now, when Devadasis, the Christians become Devadasis because they were considered worse, what's the story now? At the same time, there's a new law prohibiting all sexually open books. So all the books that were produced during Tanjavur period, I was just telling you before, Ahalya Sankrandanam, Tarasha Shanka Vijayam, all those stories of violation themes, elaborately describing the sexuality, detailed sex. They were all concerned now bad books. Especially the two people who did that. Number one was Virishalinam, who unfortunately wrote what's called Lives of Poets. I told one man from one of my lectures that the idea of writing a life of a poet is nonsense. But he was the one who created a life of a poet with a date of birth, growth and death. And in the series of lives of poets, he came to Muddu Parami. He looked at the book. Yeah, it's a very immoral book. This should be proscribed. So he wrote there saying that all the things that are in this book are not only immoral, they should not be spoken by a woman. There are other immoral books men wrote, that's okay. But here is a woman who is speaking those things. Okay? A woman cannot use those words. You cannot hear those words from the mouth of a woman. And that's what they are. And in Telugu, it's a little grammar lesson here. In the first person, men are in one class, non-men in the other class. Non-men means animals, birds, bees, and women. That's the grammatical distribution in Telugu. In plural, the human and non human. So, in, in singular, men are in one class and all the other beings are in another class. So, you can use the same pronoun for an animal, for a bird, and for a woman. There was some resistance on the part of the woman to be used by the same pronoun that was used for all the other animals and birds. So slowly people developed another pronoun to use for women. Mira Sringham uses that other pronoun called Ame for all the other women in the book, in his lives of poets. But when it comes to Muddu Padami, he simply still uses Adi, Adi, Adi the it. it, which is used for birds, bees, animals and all that. And he says, this is a bad book, nobody should read it, women should not speak words like this, and it, she's a Okay? And that was written. He didn't publish the book. He just wrote about it in his Kaviji Vitamalu, Lives of Poets. There is a very interesting woman. In fact, Bangalore has something to do with it. She's called Bengaluru Nagaratna Ma. Yeah. The woman who is in Bangalore, who lived in Bangalore, lived a great life in Bangalore, and she was a Vesha, a courtesan. Okay? This Bengaluru Nagaratna Ma, picked up the man's book in a very dilapidated shape, brought it, edited it, and published it. Published with the preface, denouncing various Lingam. Hey, various Lingam, you have denounced this book that Vaishya should not say these words. Look, I am a Vaishya. Pati Gratya, a living with one husband, is a recognition for a more married woman. We are not married women. So there's no question of Pati Pratya for Vesha. We can sleep with any man and it's nothing wrong. And I'm a Vesha myself. And she belongs to my Jati. And she picked up that book and raised a number of questions. Why do you call this book an immortal book? Are there not equally immortal books in Telugu written by men poets? And you don't find fault with them? But if a woman wrote it, it's a problem for you? So with this very, very 
was to call devastating preface, she published the book. Virya Singh was very upset. Virya Singh had a lot of power <coughs> in the government. He was working with all the people in the government with some cooperation by them. He worked hard to get the book prohibited. So the government prohibited the book. And it was Virya Singh that was behind this prohibition order. All the books that were there in bookstores were collected and taken away. Now there is a big problem. There are people who support Virya Singham and there are people who take the moral side of the story and denounce Nagaratnama. Why this? Because Christians came in and from their point of view, sex is sin. We are living in sin. We are born in sin. Not for Hindus. In fact, there is no part of the body that was supposed to be bad or immoral. There is no situation where a woman is described with all her body parts, including her pubic hair. Even Goddess Saraswati, even Goddess Parvati was described with these words. There is a story in Telugu translation where the king was going home very fast. Why was he going home very fast? Because that was the first day after the menstruation. He has to sleep with the wife that night. If he is supposed to have a good son to walk. When he is rushing home to be in time to sleep with his wife that night, there was this Nandini Dhelu. Kamadhenu's daughter, right there, but he didn't pay attention to her. Otherwise, he would normally pay respect to Dhenu and move on. But he didn't pay attention because he rushed to go and sleep with his wife. And Nandini Dhenu cursed him. Hey, may the result of what you're expecting may not happen. Why am I telling the story? When, you are when they have prescribed a book, they made sure that all the erotic parts are removed from it <laughs> and prescribe the book. But even then there are words. Even when they are describing a goddess, there are words like breasts and pubic hair and all that. Why all this situation? Because suddenly, intellectuals of India, beginning from Eurasian income up to C.R. Reddy was the next person, a very well-known intellectual, very well-known theoretician of literature, and it was known to be as important as, for that matter, of Plato's Aristotle or something like that. It was very important. His book was read by everybody as the greatest modern Telugu literary critical work. And he had a tremendous power. And he, reading all these Telugu prabandhas particularly, dismissed all of them as unacceptable. How many of them? Quite a few. In fact, he has jokes to say. The poet who describes the situation, when a husband, the new bride and the husband go into the bedroom, all the relatives leave, but the poet does not. <laughs> <laughs> he still stays in the room and describes for you what they are doing. That is the kind of language he used, how these books are obscene. So from Siyadriti onwards, Books which are considered to be very, very good books in Telugu literature. Interesting books in Telugu literature were considered bad books. Now you have a whole new definition for the period where Tanjore and later Madurai was produced in Telugu literature. It's called Shina, Shina Desha. This is the black period in Telugu literature. This is the rotten period. You should not let this. Real good period comes when the British government comes and starts having good books for them. In fact, what the British did was to encourage writers like Gary Seringham to write novels and other texts that should be used in a classroom. Because your, your Telugu texts are not worthy to be used in a classroom. They are all highly sexual. And therefore, we have to have no books written for teaching in a classroom. Therefore, 
they had various things to write a novel called Raja Sekhar Charitra. It's a horrible novel actually. <laughs> and they gave an award to it. And that was used in classes. And a number of other things happened that way. So the British government entered the classrooms, entered the literature, and changed all that, and said he's obscene, don't do this. It is a very, very interesting move. You know, that would not have been much of a problem if the poets and intellectuals themselves were not convinced that writing sex is immoral. As a result of indoctrination by Christian morality, I'll call it simply Christian morality, even though it's usually it's called Victorian morality, even poets and other writers got convinced they should not write about sex. And at that time, when the old books were reprinted, we were talking about this, any time there was a word related to sex or whatever, there were dots in the book. I have books for whole pages are dot, 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 dot. <laughs> Otherwise they'll be punished, they'll be taken to court. <laughs> After freedom, 1947 freedom, Prakasham, who was the chief minister of Andhra, removed that law. And therefore, you reprint all these books without the dots. <laughs> In fact, even texts like Kama Sutra were considered immoral, and therefore, they were not printed. At that time, there is a possibility for printing these books and smuggling into India. You go to French territory of South India, <laughs> where British law does not apply. So the books were printed in Anam, which is a French territory, and smuggled into area. And I have a bunch of books printed in Anam, actually. They're very, very careful. You have to be really careful. This was how things were going on. Even now, Telugu poets do not use sexually clear words when they're describing a woman and things like that. But there's something else coming here. His name is Rabindranath Tagore. Rabindran Tagore, even though he was writing in Bangla, considered to be a great poet, given an award as Nobel Prize, etc., is a highly colonized person, completely converted by colonial morality. That's the reason why they have to develop a Brahma Samaj, where there's no God, there's no name. If you want to read his Gitanjali, you don't get the name of God. Just a nameless God. You don't get any kind of God is the minute. There's no way of describing a woman and God, of course, having any kind of relationship. In fact, what you find in Tagore's book, it's not love, it's not Shungara, it's Agapi, God's Leela. There's no description of a woman's body in Tagore's poetry. Love of heart, yes. heart to heart. They don't even kiss. <laughs> I can go on and on if you are talking about Tagore. But Tagore's influence is very much on Andhra. People from Andhra went to Shantani Ketan to become students of Tagore. They came back, influenced by Tagore. And they wrote poetry where they were talking about a woman purely as a from the hair and eyes, that's where they go. No, they stop there. Okay? And purely there's love between a man and a woman, there's heart to heart. And nothing more than that. No touch of bodies. That kind of poetry became very popular in Telugu. It's called poetry of feeling, Bhava Kavitam. It was the reaction to earlier poetry, which was full of body. So as a result of a number of things, the British importing of Christian morality, Victorian morality, lyrical poetry of Milton and not Milton, um, Keats and all those people, which was being taught in the universities, where there's no mention of body of a woman, and Tagore, who writes poetry without reference to the body of the woman. Telugu poetry also follows the same thing, and, and, and of course there is Sierra Reddy who dismissed all the earlier poetry as bad poetry, 
and most of the world food rotary, we have an acceptance on the part of Telugu people and Telugu poets that writing about sex is immoral. You can go to any temple, you can't avoid copulating men and women on the walls. You can go for any old book, you can talk about copulation between a man and a woman. A description of copulation is one of the many descriptions that poem should have. And that's what the poets did. So now becomes a problem. Those things cannot be accepted, even though they were there in great poets, we don't repeat them, we don't write like that. Great Telugu poets do not touch sexuality in the same way as they used to before. Now word comes prema. Prema is an interesting word. Telugu has two different words. Prema and Kama. Kama is sexual love. Prema is a sexual love. I can love love for my daughter, that's Prema. I can love my mother, Prema. But love for my wife is Kama. These were very clearly separated in Telugu language. Now for the first time, concept of Prema was applied all to two sexual. Also, sexual relations are now called prema. Okay? So, I love you, which is recently used by young men and women here, is prema is used. So, I am lusting after you, using karma, is no more in the language. Earlier, there was a clear differentiation between prema and karma in Telugu literary as well as popular use. All this is because we got the conclusion with regards to Christian morality that Hindu India was obscene. We need to clean it up. Hindu literature has to be cleaned up. Hindu temples have to be cleaned up. Stories about Hindu gods have to be cleaned up. There is no part of Hinduism that goes without being censured by Christian morality or Victorian morality. The impact is really deep and it still continues, it has not changed.